Thank you. 
cross. Oh, the cross of Jesus Christ is the reason I'm alive for His blood. For His blood has set me free. It will never. It will never. Sing out again. It will never lose power for. morning. God is so good today. You can be seated. Good morning and happy Resurrection Day. It is a great day to be alive, isn't it? And to know that He is alive forevermore. I am grateful for that. I want to give some good news uh, today. Uh, I believe that all of you will be excited to hear this. That is on March the 26th, just a few days ago. 2021, 152 nations gathered online for the first global concert prayer meeting. All over the world, 152 nations out of 195 were on their faces calling on the name of the Lord. You ought to give God praise for that. I don't believe you know the significance of something of that magnitude. I want to ask you a question. Do you hear what I hear? I hear the rumblings in the heavenlies as the devil and his minions run for cover. I see the devil has awakened a sleeping giant called the body of Christ. And when the church wakes up and stands up and pushes back against darkness, heaven will send help. And I believe our help is on the way. We need to start acting like it is. We need to start believing that our help is on the way. He is alive, church. Do you know the significance of a risen Savior? It means that he conquered death, hell, and the grave. And this stuff that we're seeing is not a challenge for him today. And we need to celebrate that. I want to use two subjects today, short subjects in my sermon. One, I want to preach He is risen because you expect me to preach He is risen because you know He is risen. But the other title I want to preach, He sees you. Never lose sight of the fact that He sees you. He is risen. I want to do that first. Every promise that Jesus made was validated in his resurrection. Everything that he said he was going to do, everything that the Bible in the Old Testament said he was going to do was validated in that resurrection. And we need to know that. The best news the world ever received came out of a cemetery. Think about that for a minute. And it contained only three words. He is risen. They didn't know what to do with a risen Savior. And the majority of the world today does not know what to do with a risen Savior. He is alive, church, forevermore. He is coming back to get us one of these days. And we ought to celebrate that fact. Not just at Easter, but at every moment of our life, we should celebrate the fact that Jesus is coming back. Sweeter words have never been spoken. Revelation chapter 1, verse 17 and 18. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. That was John writing, when I saw him. Oh, some of us need to see him in the power of his resurrection. But he laid his right hand on me, saying to me, Do not be afraid. I am the first and I am the last. I am he who lives and was dead. And behold, I'm alive forevermore. Amen. And I have. Jesus said, I got something you need. He said, I have the keys 
of hell and death. He said, I hold those keys. And the Bible said that he gave those keys to the disciple. My friend, we hold the keys. There are so many beautiful scriptures around the arrest of Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus. I want to just give us a little glimpse today. Some stuff that I find that's funny. I mean, the story of his arrest was hilarious. If you've ever read the story of Jesus' arrest, it'll make you laugh. Wouldn't you like this to happen today when they come to arrest the Christian? Now, when, and when I saw him, no, give me that other in John. I'm sorry, John 18, 6. And when he said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell on the ground. There was a few hundred soldiers that came to get Jesus. And when he said, I am he, now in the, in the Greek, the word he is not there. That pronoun is not there. It was put there to make it English grammatically correct. But when he said, he simply said, I am. And when he said, I am the power of the living God that said to Moses, I am, made him fall on the ground backwards. If I went to arrest somebody and when he said his name, I fell on the ground I think I would reconsider my arrest. I know for me, I think I would be looking for a back door because they felt the power. He gave them just a little glimpse of who he was. He was letting them know, you do not take me. I am going with you because from the foundation of the world, I came into this world to save and to save those who were lost and undone and to bring deliverance and to bring hope and to bring help. Do you realize, church, that everything you need or ever will need, we don't understand this and we don't realize if we did, we'd live a lot freer. Everything was provided for at the cross and the tomb. Everything you need, everything, we just haven't learned how to appropriate it yet. We hadn't learned how to go get what God provided for us. He provided so much for us in, that, in those days that he was going to the cross. He provided so much. When they put him in that, he provided everything we will ever need. Jesus Christ was literally saying, I am God. I am here and I have power. When, he, when this name was invoked, things began to happen. This was a glimpse for us to see the power that resides in the name of Jesus. And when you're in trouble, church, you can invoke the name of Jesus because the Bible says every knee shall bow of those in heaven, of those on the earth and of those under the earth. Every knee bows. And everything you're going through in your life, if you will learn to say Jesus, we haven't learned that. We, we spend all of our time trying to make our prayers sound like the prayers of the Bible or some theologian. Stop doing that. Pray like you pray. I'm a southern boy. I pray like I pray. He knows that I don't know all the these and the thous. He understands my hillbilly talk, and he answers me in that fashion. Pray to God the way that he designed you and the way that he called you out of darkness. Let him be truly authentic, your Savior, and you be truly authentic, his servant before him. Matthew 27, 62 through 66 tells of how they guarded him. Now, at the tomb, when they laid Jesus there, you need to know something about the tomb. The tomb had a massive rock in front of it, and they would take and they would dig a trench, a downhill trench, so that the rock was easy to move into the entrance of the tomb, but it would be near impossible to roll it out. They designed it that way. And they put a bunch of soldiers, a garrison of soldiers, could have been a hundred or more. They had the Roman soldiers and they had the soldiers that the Pharisees had, the military guard that they had. All of them came around and they were guarding this tomb so that this man could not get out of that tomb. They were scared to death that what he said was going to be true. We don't want to make a mistake. We want to keep him guarded. And on the next day, which followed the day of the preparation, the chief priests and Pharisees gathered together to Pilate, saying, Sir, we remember while he was still alive how the, the deceiver said, <laughs> My Lord, look at the devil using, mm, 
After three days I will rise. Therefore command that the tomb be made secure. Until the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away. And say to the people, he has risen from the dead. So the last deception is worse than the first. Pilate said to them, you have a guard, go your way. Make it as secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure, sealing the stone and setting the guard. They set a guard there, tells the story of the Roman soldiers being placed at the tomb. What you don't understand about Roman soldiers is they were not like the soldiers today or the police officers today. If they let a prisoner escape, they would cost them their life. Now, I find it interesting that it was that much to do about a dead man. Usually, dead men don't escape. Usually they stay wherever you put them. If you put them over there, they stay over there. If you put them over here, they stay over here. But they were afraid that the dead man that they put in that tomb just might do what he said he would do and get up out of the ground. And my friend, that's exactly what he did. Now, I'm going to tell you something. Those guys would not fall asleep. A soldier would not dare fall asleep. I've been in the Marine Corps, and I've been on on a mountaintop in a foxhole in the middle of cold, rain, wind, no matter what's happening. You do not fall asleep unless you want to go to the brig. Do you know what the brig is? It's a jail. If you want to go to jail, go to sleep. You're going to jail. You do not ever abandon your post. And these guys only had to stay awake for four hours. So it is impossible for them to go to sleep unless the angel of the Lord put sleepiness in their eyes and called them to fall asleep. And the angel rolled the stone away. And Jesus came out of the tomb. And he is alive and very much alive today. He came out of that grave singing, ain't no grave going to hold my body down. And one of these days I'm going to sing the same song, ain't no grave going to hold my body down. When I hear the trumpet sound, y'all don't know the song, do you? I'm going to get up out of the ground. You better know it and we better learn to sing that song, that he is alive and that we are going to be alive just as he was alive. I could spend a lot of time today telling you that after the resurrection, all the people in the tomb that had died in the city where they put him got up and walked into the city as the fr- gifts of the first fruit of the resurrection. Can you imagine burying your grandmother and then seeing her walking downtown with her Starbucks in her hand? That caused quite a rouse in the city, you know. When they saw their dead relatives up walking, they went to sleep in the Lord. The Bible said they got up and walked as a testimony of the first resurrection. They have tried to say that he was dead. They said, one story I read said that the, they believed that wild dogs ate him. Pretty good dogs. Pretty strong dogs and pretty smart dogs. They rolled a stone away that could not be rolled away and ate a body. Where did they come up with this stuff? I don't know. And, and these are scholars that are writing this and publishing this. That dogs, really, you would write that a dog stole the body of Jesus? How is that even possible? I could tell you that he appeared to over 500 people in 13 different locations after he arose. Or that he ate fish with the disciples. But what does that mean for you and I today? It means a lot to us. It means a lot to us that he showed himself to over 500 people in 13 locations after, the, after they crucified him to show that he was very much alive. It wasn't just 13 people or 12 people saying he's alive. It was a 513 people saying he is alive. We saw him with our own eyes. That is a personal account, and you can read it in Corinthians. I don't have the time today to go there. In the beginning, God existed in a vacuum of self-awareness and self-existence. He looked throughout the earth for a friend. Aren't you glad he found you? He found none, so he created one. He created me and you and made a home for us in a garden called Eden. Man and God were alone in the garden. Adam and Eve fellowshiped freely with their father in the garden of paradise. One of these days we will fellowship freely in heaven with the Lord. It will be just like the garden of Eden. 
They had everything pleasing to the eye and pleasant to the taste in the garden. Animals walked together in kindness with, with one another. But you know the rest of the story, don't you? Adam, God's created son, and Eve sided with God's greatest enemy, Lucifer, and rebelled against God, and God sent, an a, sent a flaming sword and drove them out of the garden. Now, you need to listen to this. And Adam and Eve were marked with these words. These were the words that Adam and Eve inherited for me and you. Death and the grave. They inherited those words when they betrayed the Lord. But God was getting ready to do something miraculous. He was getting ready to take death and the grave away from us. Man divorced himself from God and became entangled with evil. Much like we are today. God could have watched from heaven, striking us with lightning bolts if we did misdeeds, but he didn't. He could have kept his hands clean from our stain of humanity, but he didn't. He laid down his omnipotence and his omniscience and his omnipresence. Jesus removed his royal crown, laid down his scepter, and announced, if I'm going to set you free, I need to be with you. And he leapt over the barrier of heaven and leapt into the womb of a 14-year-old girl and was born in a manger, destined for the cross. He came into this world to show us the way back to the Father. His blood poured out on Calvary, purchased man back from the clutches of the devil. We need to know what he did when he did that. He broke the hold of sin on the earth. He broke that hole. Don't you wish that the church of God of the Bible today would begin to stand up and believe that the clutches of sin has been broken off of the body of Christ and we can have victory in all of our life. I wish the church could get a hold of that fact. That is something that I'm learning more and more every day that he came to bring me victory. He does not have any pleasure, nor does it do any good for you and I to be Christians and burdened down with sin in our lives. Those secret things that nobody knows that we drag around like a ball and chain. We're going to deal with that in a few minutes, but first I want to finish this. He broke the, the hold of sin had on the earth. He restored back what had been stolen. He went to the enemy's camp and he took back what the enemy had stolen. He took back our peace, our joy, our health, and our freedom. How many of you thank him every morning for that? And then Ephesians 4 9 says he did something else as a by the way. I don't think I put Ephesians 4 9, but if I didn't, give me Ephesians 4 9. The Bible says that not only did he ascend, but he descended. Do you know what he did when he descended into the lower parts of the earth? The Bible said he descended into the lower parts of the earth. Why? Because there was a whole lot of people that died that had never heard the message of Jesus Christ. And he went down and preached to them and told them the story of the resurrection. And those that believed came out of that place. And I like to think he did something else while he was there. I like to think that he took the devil, the devil by the nose. And I like to think he drug him through the corridors of hell. And I like to think that he told the devil, I got a bunch of Christians on the earth. And when they rebuke you, you're rebuked. When they bind you, you're bound. When they tell you to back up, you have to back up. My friend, he was busy. He was educating the devil on what the devil could not do, but the church has not discovered that. We let him do too much in our lives. We should not let him do that. And after he had done all of that, you know, somebody thought that he laid in the tomb for three days. He did not. They threw him in the front door and he ran out the back door. He said, I got stuff I got to do. I got to go preach in hell. I got to go do this. I got to tell the devil where to go and what to do when the Christians pray. And oh my goodness, it's almost time. He ran back up, jumped on the tomb, and burst out the front door. And then he had death, hell, and grave in his hand when he did that. Let me tell you, God is a good and loving God. Today we celebrate Easter. A glorious day for the Christians around the world, but not such a glorious day for the devil. Because you see, when they crucified him 
And when they took him off the cross and put him in the tomb, they, the devil said, we have finally got rid of this troublemaker. I mean, he cast a thousand of us out of one guy. He healed the blind, the lame. He raised the dead. He did all of those things. He began to say, you know, the devil began to say, you know that woman that her son had died? We thought, sure, we were going to put that woman in abject poverty, and she was not going to never get out. And what happened? But the Son of God came along and touched the coffin and raised him from the dead. So the devil was pretty excited when they put him in the tomb. The devil was pretty excited, but he was not so excited on Easter morning when the earth began to rumble and the stone rolled away and Jesus stepped out. And because he lives, folks, I can face everything in my life, everything that we encounter. If you read the Bible, it is so full of beautiful stories about what Jesus did in three and a half short years. I mean, think about what he did for the common person. A mom who had lost a son and who did not have a husband. And it was the son's responsibility to take care of the mother because they didn't have social security back in those days. She was going to be put out in abject poverty and probably begging on the street and starve. Who knows what would happen to her? And Jesus came along. Do you think he doesn't see you? Do you think he does not see you? He sees you, church. I'm hurrying. We got to take communion. We got to do a lot of things. I'm, I'm hurrying. Because he lives, church, I can face everything. I can face all of my tomorrows and whatever tomorrow brings. Whatever I hear from a doctor, whatever I hear from the finances, whatever I hear from the government, whatever I hear from my family, because he lives, I can face it. I can be there and he can help me. Listen, in life, you're going to encounter some stuff. Some difficult stuff. But because he lives, we can face tomorrow. Before Jesus Christ, I had no future. I had no destiny. I had no hope. But then I heard an old, old story. How a Savior came from glory. How he gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch like me. How many's heard that song? I heard about his groaning, of his precious blood atoning. Then I repented of my sins and won the victory. If you won the victory, it is victory for all times. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. We need to start singing these songs in the church again. He sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him and all of my love is due him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. I heard about his healing of his cleansing power revealing. How he made the lame walk again and caused the blind to see. And then I cried, dear Jesus, come and heal my broken spirit. And Jesus did that. He came and healed our broken spirit and gave us a new song. And that new song was like this. I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. I sing because his eyes are on the sparrow. And I know that he watches over me. Calvary was God saying, I still want you. I still love you no matter what you, how bad you've messed up. God is saying, I still want you. He was saying, I See you. John chapter 13, or Luke, excuse me, Luke 13, 10 through 17. Jesus sees you. And I want to talk a little bit this morning about what he sees when he sees you. Sometimes we don't think that Jesus can see us. When I read this scripture this week, I broke down and wept. When I read, when I told my wife of this this morning, because she's going to be downstairs and she wouldn't get to hear the sermon, I wept when I said this, when I told her this story. Now, when he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath, now, get your, get your mind right, he's in church on a, on a Sabbath day. And behold, there was a woman who had a spirit of infirmity 18 years. She had a demon that had made her bent, was bent over and was bent over and could in no way raise up. But when Jesus saw her, that made me cry because I understood the context of which this scripture was written. You see, in the, in the church in America, 
we don't understand the dynamics of this verse of Scripture. In this verse of Scripture, and in those times, in the synagogues, the men sat on the, on the floor. But the women sat in a high balcony that was built way up for them to sit on. So this woman who was bent over with an infirmity was in a balcony, probably in the back of the balcony, and was bent over so that nobody could see her. And as Jesus is preaching, he saw her. And he sees you. Marginalized as the enemy tries to make you, he sees you. There was a lot of dynamics going on in this verse of Scripture. It would have been very difficult for her to be seen because of where she was sitting. She was not up front. She was not sitting as you're sitting. I can see everybody in this room, but Jesus was looking at a floor. He was not standing on a high rector like this. He was on an even floor, and he was looking out at the men. He was not looking up in a balcony. When you preach in a building that has a balcony, you never see what goes on in the balcony. All you know is that there is somebody up there, but it's dark, and you can't see it. And the only way you know they're there is if you hear an amen. What in a while. You can't see into a balcony. And Jesus could not see into that balcony with his natural eye. But he saw that woman there. He saw her in the back of the crowd. He saw her bent over. I don't know how she got in this condition, but I do know some things about her. Now, let's talk about her just for a few minutes. She was faithful to attend church because of how Jesus addressed her. Let me read the rest of the scripture, and then I'll finish. But when, he, when Jesus saw her, he called her to him and said to her, Woman, you are loose from your infirmity. And he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. But the rulers of the synagogue answered with indignation, because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath. And he said to the crowd, There are six days on which you ought to work. Therefore, come and be healed on them, and not on the Sabbath day. The, the church was upset. The church gets upset about weird things today. I mean, you do something a little different that's out of the norm, and they get upset. Then the Lord answered and said to them what he says to us, You hypocrite! Does not each one of you on the Sabbath loose his ox or donkey from the stall and lead him away to water? So ought, now listen, you need to catch a hold of that phrase, so ought this woman. Now here's where Jesus tells who this woman is. She is a daughter of Abraham. That didn't mean she was a physical daughter. It meant she was a Jewish woman. Daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has bound, think, it, think of it for 18 years. Be loose from this bond on the Sabbath. And when he had said these things, all his adversaries were put to shame. And all the multitude rejoiced for all the glorious things that he had done. Jesus was telling them at that synagogue, he was telling them that day, he was telling those Jewish leaders, ought not this woman to be healed on the Sabbath? What he was saying was because she is Jewish, because she has been attending this church for 18 years, and you have let her sit in this building, bound over by a demon for 18 years, and because she is, has a covenant relationship, with God Almighty and because I am here and I have the power and the authority to heal her, it is necessary and absolutely a must that I heal her today. Could Jesus have waited till yesterday or the day after? He could have, but he didn't. He could have healed her on the other day or this day or a day behind, but he healed her on that day. And that's the message he's sending us today. I see you. I see who you are. I see where you are. Jesus saw her, and he knew that she had a right to be healed because she was a Christian, because she was faithful, because she attended church for 18 years without missing. Jesus saw her in that mist, and he sees you where you're sitting today. Let me tell you, that is not true if you think he doesn't see you. He sees you. Jesus saw her right where she, where she was, and he sees you where you are. You may be bent over in the back somewhere feeling like you do not belong, that no one cares about you, that you do not matter, that you've messed up so much and that you're too broken to be healed. Let me tell you, that's not true. He sees you and he wants to help you. He said to this woman, woman, you are loose from your infirmity. He laid his hands on her and she was immediately made straight. God is a God of immediate. 
The church complained because it was done out of order. You know, we want to come in. <laughs> well, I just won't mess with that. I'm running out of time. We got communion to do. Jesus is saying to all of us today, I see you. I see you in your distress. I see you in your loneliness. I see you in your hurt. I see you in your fear, in your confusion. I see you in your sin. I see you, and I am here to heal you. He is saying to you today, you have a covenant right. You see, sometimes Christians do go to church, and they carry sin in their life that they should not carry. Or the enemy does things to them physically, mentally, and emotionally that we should not allow him to do. This was a faithful woman for 18 years. But this faithful woman for 18 years had a demon that had bent her over. She could not straighten up. Now, my question to you this morning is what is the enemy doing to you privately that nobody knows that's got you bent over spiritually? That makes you feel inadequate. We need to ask those questions. What is the enemy doing to me today? He uses a lot of things today. Don't see too many people bent over anymore. But you do see a host of people dealing with a spirit of fear, depression, anxiety, confusion, and on and on the list can go of what he does in the mind, making you not feel that you're adequate. Jesus sees you, and he's saying to you this morning that you have a covenanted right. You have a covenanted right to be healed because you're in covenant with him. Because you've accepted Christ as your personal Savior, you have a covenant with him that you don't have to carry this. Can I tell you from that day forward, this woman never bent over again. The Bible said she was made straight. Never did she bend over again. He sees you this morning. Chris, can you give me some music? He sees you this morning. He knows where you're at. It doesn't matter how long you've been in this condition. The woman had been there 18 years. But all it took was for Jesus to see her. That's all it took. That's the only reason that story is there. is so that you can understand that Jesus is looking at you. That's why this story is in the scripture. It was an insignificant lady. But she was in a congregation that did not have the authority to cast a demon out and deliver her. But she was faithful. She probably tithed and gave, worked in children's ministry. I don't know what all she did. And I won't even begin to say what she did. But I know this. The Bible said she was in covenant with God. And Jesus says, because she's in covenant, ought it not to be so. He is saying, it is laid upon me. It is absolutely necessary for me to heal her today. And that's what he's saying for you. Now I want you to be thoughtful in these next few minutes. And we have time. I left time for us to pray. But I want you to be thoughtful as you think about what I'm going to say in this next few minutes. Could you give me a little volume here, please? If you're in this room today, you are born again son or daughter of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the enemy has got you bent over with something. You've been carrying it in your Christian experience for a long time. For a long time. As long as you've been a Christian almost, you've been carrying this, this, this thing. If you're tired of carrying that today, you can be free. This lady went to church for 18 years and can you imagine how she must have felt? Crying out for desperation. Oh, God, heal me. And being bent over and could not straighten up. If you're here this morning and the enemy's got you bent over, you just can't find freedom and you're tired of carrying this. I'm going to ask all the church to stand with me this morning. If you're tired... of being bent over today. And that's where I want the focus of the sermon to be. All of us know that he's alive and that he's risen. 
But I don't know if all of us know that we can be free. If you want to be free this morning, if the enemy's got you bent over, come on and we're going to do what Jesus did and we're going to lay hands on you. All over the building, if you need Jesus to set you free. Listen, don't carry this another 18 years. Don't carry it another week, another day, or another moment. There's others that need to come. You just need to get out and come this morning. We're going to have the ministry team come and help us pray in just a few minutes. There are others in here that need to come. You've stood too long in the back, and you've carried stuff for so long, you think God does not see you. He sees you. This week as I was praying in my study, while in my prayer room, the Lord gave me a word today, or gave me a word a couple of days ago, and I think it's apropos for today. And that is that we're living under an open heaven. God is blessing and God is touching. Now, here's what I know. There's some more of you that should come. I'm not going to come and get you, and I'm not going to call you out because that's not my style. But you know who you are. I'm just going to ask you one more time, if you're tired of being bent over, come and we will pray for you. I'm not going to belabor this. Lionel, would you come help me pray? Sue, would you come help me? But if you're in this room and you know that you need to pray, you're tired of being bent over by this stuff, you need to come and let God help you today. Rest of you just sing along with the worship team. We're going to pray for these that have a need today. All over the building, come. Oh, yes, come and let God this morning. Come and let God do only what he can do. He can set you free. Go ahead and start praying for these and we'll come. Go ahead and start praying for them. Amazing grace. You don't have to carry it any longer. No longer. No longer. Come on, church. You guys pray for these that are here. Sing and worship and pray this morning. But now I was blind, but now I was. Let's all my heart to.